background of what I do. Uh, I'm an architect and urban designer uh, living in Canada, uh, in Toronto. And I've been practicing for the last 25 years. And I'm before that, I was a biologist. I trained as a biologist, then I went into architecture and then urban design. So all of this is sort of coming together nicely, I think, now. It only took about uh, 25 years. Um, and uh, why a 105-story hybrid wood tower, zero carbon, um, was because we at, at uh, uh, Dialogue, and I'm a uh, principal partner at a firm in, in Canada, the United States, called Dialogue, and we do planning, architecture, mechanical, electrical, structural, sustainable engineering, uh, and we're green. So we don't take on projects unless we can make them really green and in an in integrated fashion. So one of the ways for us to push the envelope of being green, um, low carbon, uh, is to design prototypes. Because sometimes clients, although clients are wonderful and they keep the wheels turning and you get to do wonderful projects for them, um, they're constrained by the current um, context. So if you want to do something that is super green, pushing the envelope, the clients may not be in a position to be able to do that. And, and that's perfectly understandable. So in order to step outside that envelope, you have to say, okay, if we, in the best case scenario, what could we do? What would technology allow us to do? What would our current conceptual environment allow us to do? So we end up doing prototypes. And this is one of a number of different prototypes that, that we're working on. And this prototype had the, uh, a number of purposes. Um, it was, uh, first of all, um, we're passionate about finding solutions to the existential challenge we face, which is climate change right now. I mean, it's, 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 it's something that is not only starting to bite, it's really biting and it's getting ever more perilous. So um, we said, okay, what kind of building solutions can we put forward that will help address that. So first of all, we said it has to be zero carbon. And second of all, we said uh, mass timber is something right now that has a lot of potential for reducing not only um, uh, embodied carbon, the, the carbon um, on the path of creating the materials for construction, but it also has the um, ability to lock up carbon, to store carbon. Um, as you know, and given the podcast you're doing and, and your work, one cubic meter of wood will store a ton of CO2. That's, that's really significant. So if you can tie up um, carbon in buildings and they, they last for a long time, if they're well designed and well built, then that's a great way to store carbon in a, in a very functional way. So the first reason we were looking at, at doing this tower was because towers use a lot of building materials. And towers in some places in the world make a lot of sense from the point of view of density um, to, to provide a, a livable habitat for, for the population. So the second reason, or the three reasons why we really got going at this um, was the first one was, as I said, we're passionate about finding solutions to reducing carbon emissions. So that was in embodied carbon. But the next one is zero carbon building um, was for reducing operating emissions. So zero carbon refers to the operational emissions uh, and the mass timber allows us to deal with the embodied carbon. Um, and the third reason was um, we're looking, as I said, to push the design envelope um, and we're looking for prototypes to help us do that. So that, that gave us um, one of the, one of the um, ways of achieving this was this idea of a, of a tall building. The other reason was you probably wouldn't be interviewing me right now if we designed a 30 story hybrid brick tower. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> May, maybe, I mean, you, you have a, a, a great podcast and you interview a I'd lot of people. You on, I'd still have you on Craig, but, uh, but no one else would. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> so we said, okay, well, uh, how do we, how do we um, create a beacon of hope and a, a tower is a beacon. And so this, this building was to be something that, that we could hold out to the world saying, there's a way to do this. There's no excuse not to do this in tall buildings. In fact, 
um, there's a, um, an association called the uh, Council of Tall Buildings and Urban Habitat. And there's gonna be an article, I understand this come January in the journal about the building because the, the, the theme of that month was it's impossible to do a zero carbon high rise. It's got a super tall building. Mm. And our building proved to be um, that that was not the case. So anyway, those are the reasons we did it. Um, and the, the other thing too was, um, there's a lot of debate in the mass timber industry about purity. It's almost religious. It's like all wood buildings. So we went anyway, what, what is this, why? Like what's going on there? I mean, the fact that you've got an all wood building, let me tell you, this, that big wood building is sitting on a, on a concrete foundation. And if it's not, then it's, it's probably yeah, not yeah. in good shape, right? <laughs> okay, and wait a minute, what's holding together? Wood dowels or is it stainless steel? Or, and there is there's some t tension um, cables or rods in there. Like I, I, I heard uh, one of the, your, your guests um, the other night talking about how to deal with the big problem of the tensile strength of wood and have running cables up the, the length of the building in order to take up that. Well, that's not pure. That's not all wood. So what, what's the whole point of doing all wood? The, the good reason to do it is because of what we just talked about, which is storing carbon, right? Using wood, sustainably harvested wood. Um, the reason not to do it is to make it all wood because it's some sort of vanity project. Who can have the tallest fail us in all wood? That's not a good reason to do it. So we said, okay, what's the real game here? What should the game be? And we said the game should be storing wood or carbon in wood, mass timber, sustainably harvested, economically viable. Tall timber buildings are just not economically, all timber are not economically viable. Because as you know, the cross-sectional area of a column to in wood is like five, six times what it would be in, co uh, in concrete or steel, right? Like it's, it, it doesn't make any sense. Your whole lobby would be wood. Would look cool, um, but it, you, you wouldn't find any developer that would be able to do it. It wouldn't, it wouldn't make sense. So what do we do that's actually economically viable and stores all this wood? Well, guess what? In a high rise building, 70% of the building materials used are in the floor system. Hmm. Hmm. That's interesting. So if you can find a floor system that is say CLT, then you can have concrete core, standard um, high rise fare and a steel exoskeleton and span the floors with CLT. That's what we started to do. Uh oh, problem. And the problem is that um, typically for a high rise, for commercial high rise, the span from core to outside wall is around 40 feet. Well, About guess what? 13 meters, I think, in metric, maybe 13, 14 meters, something like that. Yes. Yeah. But yeah. So, so um, I usually, I'm usually on American podcasts. And they <laughs> want American. We do meters and feet, depending on who wants to talk to us in Canada. <laughs> yeah. We live next door to the, a bigger, bigger country. So, um, what, uh, what that meant is if you wanted to go with CLT, it would only span um, like nine meters, right? Hmm. So what do you do? Well, we came up with a floor panel that had steel tendons embedded in mortar in the, in the floor panel on the, uh, uh, in the tension. So there were two troughs, 12 um, foot wide, uh, three meter wide, um, 3.2 meter wide panels because they fit on a truck by the length of the panel, would then um, have two slots running down the underside of the panel with steel post-tension rods in it and mortar around those. That gave it the tension it needed without having intermediate um, columns and beams. So we could then span the necessary um, uh, uh, span in a commercial floor space, which you couldn't do with CLT before. 
So we could store all that carbon. We could do it in a way that made sense from a, a commercial floor plate uh, standard. Um, and we could do it economically because the, the wonderful thing about um, wood is it's faster than um, doing um, formwork for concrete, uh, for towers and, and, the, and the steel. So you can offset the cost of the mass timber uh, uh, by the this, this schedule. And right now in Canada, uh, at least central Canada, it's only about five to 10% more expensive for the mass timber. And that's because the supply chain is not as smooth as it will be in say five years or so. So it meant that you could have a viable mass timber um, system, which means you could build tall buildings and store a lot of carbon. So that's the game. Awesome. That's a long answer to your question. Yeah, no, I like it. It's There's so much in that. There's some uh, obvious challenges that there will be in listeners' minds about the project. Are, are there any other challenges? Because I guess when you're pushing the boundaries like you are and providing this beacon of hope, the whole point or one of the big points of it is to actually get to the, um, see what the challenges are and solve them like you did with the, the post-tension timber systems. Is there any other challenges that you, you've come across? Yeah, well, there were there are two big things going on in the, the tower. One is the zero carbon and the other is the mass timber. So the, as, I, as I mentioned in, the, in our uh, former question discussion, um, the span was the big issue and we solved that with the, the tendons. Um, and then how do, you, how do you actually figure out what the right place for putting mass timber is? And that was by coming up with a floor system strategy. Um, in terms of zero carbon, um, everyone said you can't have a high rise at zero carbon because you have no, you know, have no surface, you don't have enough surface area for the PV. Well, certainly not on the roof. Um, the roof is an infinitesimally small piece of the overall surface area of the building envelope. But you can integrate PV into the building um, faces, the facades. So our um, east, south, and west facades have um, PV integrated them. So in Australia, it would be east, north, and west, right? But th those are, the, those are the, the facades that get a lot of um, sun, get sun. That was able to provide us with 20 to 25%, depending on the season, of the energy requirements of the building. So, okay, that means it's 75% energy there that has a carbon footprint to it. In Ontario, the carbon footprint's not very high because we use mostly hydro and nuclear and, and some natural gas uh, for peak um, for electricity. So the, the, the carbon footprint's pretty low, but nevertheless, it's got a footprint. So um, what we did to solve that problem was use a very, very cool new technology um, called uh, algae bioreactor. And that's, that's created by a company called Pond Technology. And I can provide you the link mm. for your listeners if you want. And what happens there is this uh, bioreactor is just a big tank of water with very, very high intensity high efficiency LED lights in it and algae. That's why it's called pond, like pond scum. And you bubble in um, the uh, emissions from a gas generator, electrical gas generator into the tank and the algae just eat it all up. So you can do two things with that. You can either take that and then burn it again. So it's like cyclical, or you can take it and use it to uh, ameliorate soil. And, and if you grow um, nitrifying um, uh, algae, like cyanobacteria algae, blue green algae, then you can use it to um, create greater densities of carbon in soil. So that is a, one of the reasons you want to do the towers say this technology exists that we can strip the carbon out of uh, a gas generating system. So that would mean in, if you had natural gas generation going on in your city, you could take this pond bioreactor and take the, the carbon out. We created a um, uh, cogen plant in the building. The building had enough uh, square footage, it's like a small town. We used the cogen to heat the building as well as to provide the electricity for the building that wasn't being provided by PV and then took the CO2 
out of the, the um, uh, emissions from that generation and uh, put it through this bioreactor. So that was our way to get to zero carbon. Amazing. That really is, uh, really is innovative. So you mentioned we're using a steel exoskeleton with a concrete core as the stability system. Um, and you, um, are you using glue lamb columns or what are you using for the, the vertical elements and, and, and the columns? All, all the vertical elements are steel. Gotcha. So it's spanning yeah. from the concrete to the exoskeleton yeah. and then you're using right. timber floors. All and, the and, way it, out. and it's a, di it's a diagrid. So it's a yep. very, very efficient steel skeleton on the outside. Yeah. Beautiful. That's so uh, interesting because yeah, all high rise buildings, what you've shown is there's no reason why they can't start using, using timber floor systems. I'd imagine there's a bit of detailing to go with the, the diaphragm to at that height to, uh, to, to get everything going, but you've just shown that it, everything's possible. Yeah, and, and what we did was we used stand, the, the engineer that, that was involved in, in detailing the, the skyscraper. He does tall buildings, that's his thing. Um, so he was able to put together a system where the core every, I think it was every 20 stories connected by big steel trusses to the exoskeleton. So all of it tied together and the floors were not actually having to do any work in, in shear. They were just doing work in, in supporting the, the, the dead loads and the live loads above. I have to send this to, because uh, in Australia, in Sydney at the moment, there's a, a building by Atlassian. So it's one of Australia's big tech companies. And uh, they're actually looking to build a 40 story building similar to what you've done in the sense that they got using timber floors all the way up. Yeah. But, um, I think some of your early pioneering research into this might be really of, of interest. Uh, how, where are they? How far along are they? Uh, I'm not sure. They're in design phase, very early design phase at the moment. Um, well, have, I, have them give us a uh, have uh, them give us a call, and at least our engineers. I'm sure they've got some architects that have got the design well underway. Yeah. But uh, uh, in terms of the uh, structure, have them give us a call. Mm. So you, this was a big strategy from your organization for, for climate change. So where does mass timber fit in overall adaption to the changing planet? Oh, well, just a small question. Eh? <laughs> um, so uh, I, I think one of the things that is a, is a, is a hopeful possibility is that we can increase the surface area of forests on the planet. Um, one of the things that um, I remember reading in um, uh, a book called the ends, the ends of the World was at the various mass extinctions um, through time, what had caused them. And I think it was, um, one of the one of the maybe the second um, mass extinction, it was caused by the evolution of trees. So you know, over hundreds of millions of years, you know, basically algae crawled out of the water and over time evolved into trees, and the trees moved inland and they covered the planet with forests, and the forest sucked so much CO two out of the atmosphere that it caused an ice age. The ice age just basically wiped everything out, mm. except things right at the, at the equator. So I thought when I read that, oh, you mean you could really, really alter the course of climate with forests? We got to start planting more forests. Like we need to figure out how to do this. Well, the only way you're going to get human beings to take forests seriously is if they have value. And one of the ways that they can have value is that they can be harvested, not clear cut harvesting, which is disastrous for the release of carbon. You clear cut and the carbon comes out of the soil and then you're actually, you might as well be using concrete or steel. Um, it's probably worse than concrete or steel. So I think if you do it right, a healthy forest, um, agroforest industry could be a real solution to sucking CO2 out of the atmosphere. Because right now we keep talking about reducing emissions. Well, there's CO2 in the atmosphere already. We're at like 480 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere. I think 489 now, like 350 is what's sustainable. So I think um, 
that there's a lab in, in uh, Zurich, the Thomas Crowther lab at ETH Zurich came out with a study a number of months ago that said planting 1.3 trillion trees uh, was possible given the amount of area on the planet that could take them. It wasn't urban, that wasn't farm area. Um, and so it's like, wow, okay. And that would basically suck 10 years worth of CO2, the past 10 years out of the atmosphere. Now, you've got to get it growing. But nevertheless, I, I think trees are one of the solutions. So we need, mm. we need business models that value trees. And I think that's one of the reasons to, to have a healthy a mass timber industry. Yeah, absolutely. And I think this is something that a lot of people, um, well, it took me a while to start understanding, but say if someone's got a big piece of land, um, there's a few options what they can do with it. If the value of, of growing uh, timber and sucking carbon dioxide out of the air, <clears throat> and, then, and then at the end of their life, <clears throat> excuse me, at the end of its life, uh, you know, using it as a building product, if that makes sense financially, that's what they're going to do, you know, instead of maybe doing a different form of agriculture that actually puts out emissions. So, you know, projects like yourself, what you're putting up there where you're increasing the demand by such a, such a big amount, it can be pos very positive for, for sucking carbon dioxide out of the air, obviously. Um, then obviously there's a lag between it takes 30 years to grow a tree. So we need to be really proactive with these these kind of things yeah and and and, and no, i don't think it's a, a silver bullet but um one of the things that this does is it injects into discussion um just ongoing debate in society about carbon and carbon being part of wood and carbon being part of forests um in a way that it wasn't wasn't happening before so i think Having a building like this, you're talking to me about this building. Other, like I've been interviewed by people around the world about it, and we get to talk about the importance of carbon every time. If you just say carbon's bad, we're polluting the atmosphere, it's terrible, the oil companies are terrible, people like tune out, like they've heard that a million times before. But if there's all of a sudden something that you can do that's positive, and they go, oh, that's interesting, that's hopeful, People want to hear hopeful things that are real and are economically viable. And I'll tell you, if it's not economically viable, in other words, if someone's not going to make some bucks out of it, it's not going to happen. Yeah. So, so I think we need to be, as, as architects and engineers, um, it's nice to design pretty buildings. That's good. But we need to be doing more than that. And I, so I think this kind of a project um, and the kind of projects that you're talking to people about on your podcast, oh, good on you, by the way, I listened to a number of your podcasts and all the people you got on there are doing really cool things, um, are, are what will get people interested in taking this seriously. Yeah. Are there any other projects that you're leading at the moment at Dialogue, Craig, that you can tell the, the listeners about in this, in this similar space? Yeah. Um, so um, we're doing... Uh, a number of projects that are um, mass timber projects for clients that are interested in, in doing you know, schools and, and, and uh, uh, various types of institutional. But in terms of doing cutting edge research type prototypes like this one, um, there's a couple that we're doing right now. Um, one is for a zero carbon mass timber um, biotech research center. Um, and the reason we're doing that is because biotech is really big right now. I mean, think of all the companies that are looking at viruses and, 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 and other sorts of agents that, that is a very viable from a profit point of view, but also something that's intensely being focused on by universities around the world. So we said, well, let's use that intensity to put mass timber and zero carbon into the mix as something that's interesting. Also, all of the clients of mine that are universities are, are very interested and colleges are very interested in mass timber right now because biophilia, students like it and they're all competing for students. So we're doing a project right now for um, a college called Centennial College in, in Toronto. And it is um, a mass timber lab and classroom facilities um, in, in digitally inspired. Uh, and uh, you just, 
want to be in it. Like you, you're going to walk in and go, wow, this is so cool. So, uh, but it's, it's, it, it's not zero um, carbon on site, it's zero carbon by having carbon offsets and so forth. So the lab facility that we're designing as a prototype is zero carbon on site. So we're going to use some of the similar technology we just talked about today. Amazing. So exciting. And if people want to find out about, more about yourself, Craig, and Dialogue, and your own podcast as well, where, where should they be going? Okay, so uh, on the Dialogue side, just go to our website, which is www.dialoguedesign.ca. And for my podcast, it's called the 21st Century Imperative podcast and that's tfcipodcast.com phenomenal and i'll put our links to both of those things in the show notes so thank you so much for coming on the podcast craig it's been an absolute uh, pleasure to be speaking to you and meet you my pleasure